I invite you to turn with me in your scriptures to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. Would you bow your hearts together with me in prayer? Father, we are so indebted to you for the wonderful experience of being part of your family. And we confess that there are so many things that we are still learning. And we're here today for the purpose of learning more about you. Learning more about you so that we can more effectively share you with others. And so realizing the importance of what we're about to study today, I want to offer myself as a vessel of fresh and anew into your hands at this very moment. Please cleanse me with the washing of the blood of your dear Son. Please anoint me with the power of your sweet Holy Spirit, so that the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart will be acceptable in your sight, so that your design purpose might be accomplished for each of us as individuals, as families, and as a church collective. Because I pray this prayer and give you praises for the victory in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things that I have learned in the last few years of being part of the remodeling and adding on to the house that Rebecca was born in is the need for a support system. I discovered that in order for the superstructure of the walls and the roof, etc., to be all that they should and could be, I needed to make sure that the foundation, the support system, was in good working order. Today we're looking at intercession being the support in discipleship. We are in the midst of investigating both in Sabbath school classes and in the worship service here at Little Creek, the importance of discipleship. And I'm convicted in my intellect and convinced in my emotions that if we are going to be an effective church fellowship where discipleship is prominent and productive, we must have a good support network system in place. In John chapter 17, we find the farewell prayer of Christ for his disciples. This prayer was especially related to the welfare of the disciples after he would leave their side. The prayer in John chapter 17 is perfectly arranged. And so because this prayer is perfectly arranged, it would do you and me good, it would do us good to allow the prayer of John 17 to be an inspired guide because we want to follow the example of Jesus. Just as Christ interceded for his disciples you and I need to intercede for one another today. Now, we've given kind of an overview before we get into the specifics. We need to notice that the emphasis in Christ's prayer, John chapter 17, is threefold. Number one, Jesus prayed for himself. Now, I may be foolish, but if I am, I'm going to err in this regard. If Jesus sensed the need and imperative for praying for himself, do I not also need to pray for myself? Secondly, we discover that Jesus prayed on behalf of the disciples who were to remain after he left. Now again, if I'm going to err, I'm going to err on this side. If Jesus saw the necessity of praying for disciples who were yet to remain, 
Should not I also follow his example and pray for disciples after I leave? Thirdly, Jesus prayed for disciples yet to believe. Disciples who were not yet disciples, but men and women, boys and girls who would become disciples because they believed in his name. And again, I may be foolish, but if I am, I'm going to err on the side. If Jesus saw the need of praying for disciples yet to become disciples, should not I pray like Jesus prayed for those yet to become a part of the family of God? Now, having given that in, uh, overview, I want us to notice verses 1 through 5 as Jesus prayed for himself. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hours come. Glorify thy Son that thy Son may glorify thee. Now, it's very important for you and for me to understand that the first thing that Jesus prayed for was that the Father be glorified. And as you and I pray for ourselves, we must follow the example of Christ. Because when everything is said and done, that must be the motif of our life and of our living. To bring glory to God. As thou hast given him, talking about himself, power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, Glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. In the course of this prayer, these five verses, Jesus refers to himself at least 11 times. And again, I would say, if Jesus sits the need of praying for himself... You and I should also sense the need of praying for ourselves today. Because the Bible tells us we have not because we what? We have not because we ask not. And it's important for us to know that other people are praying for us, but you and I must be praying for ourselves. And that's not selfishness. That's just following the pattern, the example of Jesus. Now I want us to look at the disciples in Christ's prayer. And first of all, we want to notice his relationship with those disciples because in order to understand the process of interceding for them and your interceding for me and my interceding for you, we must understand the relationship Christ had with those disciples. First of all, his relationship with those disciples was a godly relationship. Look at verses 6 and 7. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. The relationship of Christ to those disciples was a godly relationship. We need to underscore in our minds and in our hearts that word manifested. Jesus manifested God's name to them. Now what does that word manifest mean? It means he displayed God to them. And in our relationship with one another, our relationship as disciples of Christ must be the same as Christ with the disciples. We must have a relationship that is based on godliness. 
You see, the relationship is not based on who I am, even though who I am is important in relationship. The relationship is not based on elevating myself. The relationship is on displaying God. Question. What kind of relationships would we have if we all practiced this with one another? The important thing in our relationship being to display God, to manifest God. Secondly, we discover that the relationship of Jesus to those disciples was centered on the scriptures. Centered on the scriptures. Look at verse number 8. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. In the relationship of Jesus with those disciples, God's word was the preeminent essence of his life demonstration. Too often, we try to develop relationships with one another on what we think. Now, what we think is important. But I've told people publicly and I tell them privately, don't tell me what you think, tell me what God's word says. I was tra traveling out west a number of years ago and I read a bumper sticker that went like this. God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Now that sounded good to me at the time. But since then I've changed my thinking about that bumper sticker. If I were developing a bumper sticker along those lines, it would go like this. God said it. That settles it, whether I believe it or not. <laughs> I like that, don't you? Now, you can make up a bumper sticker and you can sell it and you can become a millionaire. You can get Pat to market it for you. Okay. But our relationships must be based on God's word. And we get in trouble in our relationships when we deviate from the scriptures. When we start inserting what we think about this and maybe, you know, we need to stick with the word. Thirdly, the relationship of Jesus to those disciples was unique. Verses 9 and 10. Now, I really want you to get this. This is so very, very important. Father... I pray for them, underscore this next phrase, I pray not for the world. You ever seen that? Now, did God love the world? John 3, 16, did God love the world? Did Jesus love the world? Did Jesus ever pray for the world? You better believe he loved the world and he prayed for the world. But in the setting of this prayer... He is not praying for the world as important as the world was. Who is he praying for? But for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in who? I am glorified in them. You see, the relationship of Christ with those disciples was a unique relationship. My brothers and sisters, as important as the world is to Little Creek Seventy Adventist Christian Fellowship, we must never lose focus of the fact that we are unique to one another here because only as we respect the uniqueness of we as individuals and as a group will we effectively be able to communicate unto the world outside I love you 
Now, Rebecca and I, our membership is still at Wilson Seventh day Adventist Christian Church. But don't tell them what I'm about to say. Well, they, they're going to hear it anyway if they tune in on the internet. But I have a unique relationship with this church that I don't have with them. Because you are special in my life in a way that they are not. And that doesn't mean I don't love them. Understand? You are unique. We are unique as the body of Christ here. We're all important. We are all special to Jesus. And because we're members of this fellowship, we are special to one another and unique to one another. That's the relationship Jesus had with them. That's the kind of relationship we're to have with one another. Now, secondly, not only is it important to notice and understand his relationship with those disciples, but it's important to understand his personal desire and concern for them. Now, as I go through these personal desires and concerns for those disciples then, on the part of Jesus, I want you to understand that Jesus still has those personal desires and concerns for every one of us as disciples today. And you and I should and must have the same desires and concerns for one another as Jesus has for us. Number one. He said in verses 11, 12, 14 through 16, in his prayer, his concern and desire was that they be kept. Father, and now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, to keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost but the son of perdition, talking about Judas, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Now verse 14. And I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They're not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Did you notice over and over and over again that word keep or kept? The concern of Jesus and the desire of Jesus for those disciples was that they be kept. He's praying for their safety. He's praying for their protection. He's praying for their preservation. Jesus is still praying that prayer on your behalf and my behalf today in the heavenly sanctuary. Now, if Jesus had that kind of concern and desire for his disciples then and disciples today, should not we have that same kind of desire and concern for one another? Question. Is there a single member of this fellowship that you want to see lost? Is there one? If there is, you need to hit your knees and ask for forgiveness. You see, we should be praying for one another. We should be interceding for one another. We should be supporting one another that none of us would be lost. But we would all be kept. When I was a young man, young minister, I heard a preacher, an older preacher, say this. He said, if the devil is not after you, watch out. He probably already has you. And I remember that. Do we understand that the devil is a roaring lion? And he's not choosy how he gets us. Just so he gets us. And he's out after John. And, and he's out after Marvin. And he's out after Darren. And he's out after Pastor Dan. 
And I need to be praying for you and you need to be praying for me. Not just on Sabbath, but every day. That we will be kept from the tentacles of the enemy of God and the enemy of the human family. Because if the devil can destroy Earl, a part of the body of Christ has been diminished and we are not the same. Understand what I'm saying? You are too important. I am too important for us to be lost. And I need to be praying for you because you're out in the workplace that I'm not. And, and you need to be praying for me because I'm experiencing things in my life that you're not. We need to be praying for one another that we be kept. Secondly, Jesus had a desire and Jesus had a concern that they be a joyful people. Look at verse number 13. Father, and now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, and I love this, that they might have my joy fulfilled or full in themselves. Christ was asking the Father for those disciples then and disciples today to experience a deep, abiding inner happiness and commitment of contentment. Do we really understand that Jesus wants us to be happy? Do we understand that? He wants us to be a joyful people. And he prayed to the Father that those disciples would experience that. Because Jesus knew they were going through hard times of unbelief relative to the resurrection and all that would transpire in relationship to his leaving them. And they would become despondent, down in the dumps and gloom, could overshadow their lives. And he's saying, Father, I am praying that their joy might explode. And how would their joy explode? As his joy was fulfilled in them. My brothers and sisters, we should be praying for one another the same way. Because I'm human and so are you. And every now and then... I heard a long time ago that confession is good for the soul. Now, we need to make sure we're confessing to the right people in the right place at the right time. Okay? But it's good. I have my moments of gloom and doom and darkness. And some of you have seen that side of me. And just in case nobody has told you or reminded you, you probably do too. And we need to be encouraging one another. Praying for one another. That Janelle's joy will be full in Jesus. That Faith's joy will be full in Jesus. Irregardless of, of what they have to go through. Whether it's a stay-at-home mom or, or someone who's a caregiver and out in the public. Pray for Pastor Dan that his joy will be full. Can you imagine what kind of fellowship we will have if we pray for one another like that? Thirdly, his desire and concern was for them was their sanctification. Now, sanctification is a word that a lot of people struggle with. Sanctification literally means to be set apart from the world unto God's truth. Very simple. Drop down to verse 17. Father, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. So Jesus was praying that his disciples would be set apart from the world. 
And Jesus is still praying the same thing for you and for me to experience today. To be set apart from the world. You see, God has not called us to be of this world. As long as we live, we will be in this world, but we can live in this world and not be a part of the world. We can be a peculiar people set apart unto good works, not through our own righteousness, but through the righteousness of Jesus the Christ. Because God hasn't called us to look like the world, to talk like the world, to act like the world, to eat and drink like the world. God's called you and God's called me to be different. Now, even as Jesus prayed for disciples in and still is praying for disciples today to be sanctified and be set apart, I should be praying for you like that and you should be praying for me like that. Because the Bible says... When I see a brother that is overtaken in a fault, I should put my number ten and a half foot on his or her head and squash them even lower. Is that what it says? No. When I see a brother or sister that is in jeopardy of joining forces with the world, I pray for that individual that they might be delivered and experience victory in their lives. Because you see, eternity is at stake. We pray for one another when we see one another overtaken in a fault. We don't condemn them. We don't put them down. We we lift them up to the throne of grace. And say, Father God, some way, somehow break through. So they can understand with mind and heart that this world is going to pass away. But eternity is forever. Set apart to be different. Not for the sake of just being different, but different for the sake of representing Jesus. Then he prayed his desire and concern was for their unity and for our unity. Look at verses 21 through 23. Father, I'm praying that they may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, so that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Jesus is still praying for unity in his body. Now, is that promoting ecumenical mentality? No. Because we've already dealt with the need of being separated or set apart. But what it does mean, my brothers and sisters, that as Jesus prayed for our unity, even so we must be praying for unity among ourselves. It's very important to adopt in mind and in heart that we will agree to be agreeable even though we may disagree you understand that? you see you may not see eye to eye with me on everything and I may not see eye to eye with you on everything but I'm not going to allow that If I'm praying for you and you're praying for me to bring a relationship sever in our lives. I don't know of anything that Andy and I disagree on. But if we do, Andy, if there's something, you come to me and and I'll come to you and, and we'll work it out. Because unity is so important. Because when everything is said and done, the world is at stake. Because if the world does not see unity among us, how do we expect the world to be one to the cause we're trying to represent? And so we pray for unity. That's a concern and a desire. Number five, Jesus had a desire and a concern for their destiny. 
and we should have the same desire and concern for one another's destiny. Look at verse number 24. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Now, I could preach about 45 minutes on that one verse. Our destiny. Where is our landing place to be? What is our destiny to be? In the flames of destruction? Where does God want us to land? On the other side. And you and I should be praying for one another's destiny. Because heaven is big enough for all of us. <laughs> The new earth is going to have plenty of room for all of us. And I want to be there. And I want you to be there. And I hope you want me to be there. We should be praying for one another's destiny because the path we walk is so treacherous. When Rebecca and I first became members of the Seventh-day Adventist Christian Church, and I don't think she'll mind this, she was really kind of discouraged in some areas. One day she went across the road. We were living there close by Southwestern Adventist College at that time, University now. And she sat on a little bench there in the park area, and there was a mural that one of the students had put together, Mosaic. And the mosaic was of a vision that one of the individuals who was used by God to bring about a beginning in the Seventh-day Adventist Christian Church, a vision that this individual had, and it was displayed there. It was a, a vision of the pathway leading up to heaven. And as Rebecca sat on that bench, she noticed that, that there were people falling off the sides. But there were other people who were remaining true. And it dawned on her that those who were falling off the sides were not looking up to the throne. They were looking around about them. Oh, my brothers and sisters, the devil wants us to get to looking round about us and take our eyes off the throne. But we need to pray for one another. That soon and very soon we will all land safely on the other side. And I have already put in a request to Father God. Now I don't, I don't think I will have any say so in where I'm going to live in heaven. But I've already put in a request for the new earth. And my request is that Father God will let me live real close to you folk on the new earth and if I don't live real close to you I think I can get to you real fast don't you want to go to heaven don't you want us all to be there oh Alex that's going to be good when we get to the other side of the new earth maybe some Sabbath you can just lead us in a song <laughs> be praying about our destiny then he prayed his concern and desire was concerning their knowledge. And we should be praying for one another in the same way, the knowledge. Look at verse 25. O righteous Father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee. And these have known that thou hast sent me. Oh, we should be praying, brothers and sisters, for one another concerning knowledge that that you should be praying for me that I would know Jesus more and, and I should be praying for you that you know Jesus more because there's so many vain philosophies and, and traditions out there that would sidetrack us but it's important to know in whom we have believed and are persuaded that he is able to keep that which we've committed unto him against that day Pray for me, because there's a whole lot I don't know yet. I made a comment to Rebecca on the way over here this morning that I had done something this week that 
four years ago I would have never done. You, you see, God wants us to grow in grace and in knowledge. And it was a positive thing I did. But you need to be praying for me and I need to be praying for you. That we would know more about Jesus. Because as we know more about Jesus, we'll know more about one another. And then finally, Jesus prayed his desire and concern was for their and for our love relationship. And so should we be praying for one another. So should that be our desire and concern. Now I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this point because next week we're going to have the whole sermon on this area. But Jesus' desire and concern was for their love relationship. Look at verse number 26. Father, I have declared unto them thy name, and I will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in thee. Why do we need to pray for one another? Why should we have this desire and concern about this love relationship? Because when everything is said and done, love will cover a multitude of sins and transgressions. We used to sing a song when I was a little boy in the Pentecostal church growing up. He looked beyond my faults and he saw my needs. And when we pray in this concern and desire for one another in this love relationship, I'm sure Darcy will tell me that Lee has some faults and maybe some shortcomings, but we won't tell Lee he has them. But if, but if I'm praying in this kind of attitude, you think maybe I won't see as a brother some of those things in Lee? But I see the love of Jesus. <laughs> what a prayer. Father God, I just want to pause and thank you, Jesus, for praying this prayer. Because over the years, it's meant so much to me and it means more to me today than it ever has and Father as we as Little Creek Adventist Fellowship are looking in your direction to know how to represent you in a more acceptable fashion please help us Lord as I've tried to impress over and over again in the series so far please impress the importance of of us understanding and accepting what being a disciple is all about so we can more effectively be instrumental in making disciples of others. Oh Lord, we want to come to that place where we are covered by the blood, where the cross is shadowing our lives, where Jesus and Jesus only is lifted up. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing, what you're going to continue to do, as we allow Christ to be our example. Because I pray this prayer and give you praises for victory. In Jesus' name, amen.